read all of it, about men in Luke chapter 16. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I want you to listen real, real careful. Luke chapter 16 and verse number 19. There's a certain rich man. He didn't go to hell because he was rich. But his riches probably kept him from being saved. It's not possible to be saved and have a lot of money, but it's like sticking a camel through a needle's eye to quote the Lord. And I said needle, not gate. See, nowadays they say, well, that was a gate outside Jerusalem and Nemo had to get down on its knees and all that. Well, I don't believe the Lord said that. I think He said needle. And you say, you say, well, how do you know He meant that? Because about two verses later, He said, with men, this is impossible. You can't in here put a camel through a needle's eye. If you did, that's an awful little camel or a big needle. One of the two. You can't do it. But the Lord can. With God, all things are possible. And that's the only way this rich man could have been saved, with the Lord. Same way me got saved. Look at it. There was a certain rich man, Luke 16, 19, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid his gate full of sores. Stop again. I'll make a long introduction this morning. Short message, long introduction. Instead of vice versa. It is absolutely, it, it's, it's unbelievably important what you think about hell. Here, the Jehovah Witness, uh, the church world of tomorrow, which is the Armstrong Act, would try to tell you that this story is a parable. There's some Jehovah Witnesses. I was talking to them down at the house one day at my sister's house, and I said, here's a fellow who died and went to hell. And they said, oh, that's a parable. A parable is a story with a heavenly meaning that uses an illustration and, and with fictitious characters that really, in fact, do not exist. Now, one reason, among many reasons, you know that this is not a parable is because personal, proper names are used in this story. Lazarus, for example. There is no person in a, there's no such thing as a person and personal name used in parables. When the Lord gave a parable, He'd say it's like a window, it's like a tree, it's like the sky, it's like a rock, it's like seed in the field, it's like a barn, it's like a mustard plant growing up. He didn't say John and Joe and Bill and tell about specific people. This was a real story with two real people in it who died and went to two real places when they left. And in this story, the Bible said this rich man fared sons of every day. Lazarus laid his gate full of sores. Verse 21. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. See, he died, was buried, and then went to hell. And he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Anytime, listen real carefully, listen real carefully. Anytime a man tries to tell you that hell is a place here on earth, that man either has not read the Bible or else doesn't believe the Bible. Here's a man who went to hell after he died. After he died. After he died. And the Bible said that he was tormented after he died. You say, preacher, I take it you believe in hell. I don't believe in hell if I believe in the Bible. If you don't believe in hell, you don't believe the Bible. Hell's all the way through the Bible. You either, you're forced into it. You either say, the book is wrong and there's no hell, or the book is right and there is a hell, or we'll change the book because it really didn't mean hell. 
And ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I wish it wasn't that way. I wish there wasn't no such place. But they, down inside my heart, I know, and you know, there is a real place called hell. And brother, when you start believing in hellfire, it'll change the way you look at everything. You become a fanatic. If there's really a fire where people go to, you, you may have read the statement, one statement Pat Job made in the McDowell News, and I use his name publicly because he uses mine publicly. Fair enough, right? One statement Pat Job made in the paper this week that was right. And I agreed with 100%. He said an old preacher told him one time, if there was a real fiery burning hell, a person could not spend their life doing anything greater than keeping people out of that hell. That's right, brother. That's right. There ain't nothing we can do any greater than keeping people out of hell if hell fire is real. If it's not real, go fishing next Sunday. Amen? If it's not real, I'll go get me a job selling vacuum cleaners. If it's not real, let everybody just do what they want to or I'll die. That'll be the end of this big deal, man. Look it up, have a big time. You know why I'm here? I believe in hell. You know why I preach every Sunday? I believe there's a hell. You know how come we, we go and pray and fast and do it there and witness on the street and tell people about God? There's a hell that they're going to if they're not saved. I talked to uh, a guy from a paper took me out and bought me a steak the other day. And the Charlotte Observer paid for it. It's about time they'd done something for us. And... I said, uh, are you saved? He interviewed me about an hour, and I turned on him and started popping him some questions. And I said, are you right with the Lord? And he said, I don't like to be interviewed. That's what he said. I said, well, you're going to get it anyway. Are you a Christian? He said, well, I'm still lost in. I don't know if there's a heaven or hell. When I was telling you about a minute ago, I said, hey, man, you better be finding out. You're going to die. He said, well, I don't like to think about that. What do you mean? You're going to. You got to face it. We'll kick the bucket. And I said, "There's a heaven. There's a hell." And he said, "There's one thing for sure. If there's a heaven, my mother's going there." Because it really touched him last Sunday morning. What we said about the mothers. And he said he went and called his mother. And uh, he said, "For one thing for sure, if there's a heaven, my mother's going." And I said, "Yeah. If there's a hell, you're going." And he said, "Thanks a lot." I said, well, people love you, man. We're here, and you're going to hear it some more if you hang around here. Now, I'm telling you, listen, the newspapers ain't the most important thing in the world. The TV cameras are not the most important thing in the world. Your job's not the most important thing in the world. I'm going to tell you something, friend. The most important thing in the world is where are you going when you check out of this place? You can't do any higher or more important than that. I want to preach to you about this fellow that went to hell. He lifted his eyes being in torments and cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. You believe there's fire down there? Listen to Jesus Christ. For I am tormented in this flame. There's no fire! With real flames in hell. You say, good night. I didn't know I went to one of them old churches where they believed in hell, fire, and damnation. A church has no right to call itself a church that doesn't in hell. A preacher has no business preaching that don't believe in hell. The greatest preacher that ever lived on this earth told this story that I'm telling you this morning. He said there's a hell. And of course... He wanted somebody to go testify to his brethren to keep them out. Nobody could go. I want to preach to you just a few minutes this morning. I'll be brief. I'm just going to name these things off on the subject, Lessons from a Lost Soul. You see, in this story, ladies and gentlemen, a man was, 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 was dead. Two men died, matter of fact. And this one fellow was real rich. He was clothed in the finest clothes. He had anything a man could want. 
He could snap his finger and servants come running. I mean, he laid back in a big hammock and they brought palm branches and fanned him, you know. And he'd say, turn it up on high. They'd turn it up on high. They'd bring in more guys. That was air conditioning. Just as nice as what we got now. Except they had slaves to do it for him. And they'd drop grapes in his mouth, you know. And mess around, comb his hair, whatever he wanted. I mean, file his toenails. Get the toe jam out between them. Do anything he wanted them to do. Uh, he, was he was rich. He fed sumptuously every day. He flat had it made. Outside the gate, there was an old beggar. He had old sores all over him. There's a bad shape that dogs come and lick them sores. And brother, his name was Lazarus. And the Bible said that Lazarus died. And brother, when he died out there, he had them heavenly pallbearers. I heard an old preacher preach a sermon one time, and the name of the sermon was this. All you preachers remember this. Good title for a sermon. Here's the title. It fit on a tape label, but it's a good one. No man attends his own funeral. He had an appointment and left earlier. That's the title of the message. I'll say it again. No man attends his own funeral. He had an appointment and left earlier. What was his appointment? It is the point of the man once to die. He had an appointment with God that he had to keep and missed his funeral. So you've been gone three days time they bury you. And nobody goes to their own funeral. But this old boy died and he had all bearers come. And they were angels. And they picked him up and took him to Abraham's bosom. And then... The Bible said, the rich man also died. And when he died, heart attack, maybe, something got him. He was buried and he went to hell. Now let's look at some lesson. There's nothing more terrible than a lost soul. There I've seen pictures of gunshot. I've got a book, some of you saw it, called Violence in Our Time. And it shows people with bullet holes through their head and falling off buildings and hunt where people hung themselves and they're just gross, man. I mean, blood coming out of their eyes and, and that's a grotesque picture. And it's very sickening to look at and it'll make you sick. But there's nothing more terrible or horrible. You, Friday 13th couldn't take a hold a lot to how horrible it is for a man to have. Have, have you ever noticed in the newspapers it's in, and in the books that they write, it's always, I saw heaven, I saw heaven on the inquire, sun, star, all in May. Somebody says, I saw heaven, I saw heaven. Nobody ever says, I saw hell. I went to hell. I went to hell and back. It's always, I saw heaven. You know why? People don't like to think about hell. We like to put it out of our minds. We like to hope that it doesn't exist. We like to hope and pray and live our life as if there was hell. And most people are living their life just like there was no hell. Even church members live their life like there's no such place. I'm telling you, either the Bible's a lie or there is one. Either the Bible's a lie or there is one. I don't believe this book is a lie. I believe there is a hell. Now let me give you these lessons right briefly. Here's some lessons we can learn from a lost soul. Number one, a man may appear beautiful before men, but yet be wicked in the sight of God. It's not how you look before men this morning, but how God sees you. You, you listen to me this morning? You ladies, you hear me? It's not how you look to other people that really matters. It's how God sees you. You mean, it's not how you appear, how strong you are, what kind of car you drive, but how God sees you. You may appear beautiful before men, yet be wicked in the sight of God. You could walk down the street and say, uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about the rich man. Everybody say, yeah, man, boy, he's got it made, ain't he? I mean, he drives that convertible camel, and it's got, I mean, and it's got everything a person could want. He's got AM, FM, stereo, auto, reverse cassette, and equalizer, and, and power boomers, weepers, tweeters. <laughs> well, he's got everything that a person could want. I mean, he's the coolest of the cool. Then you go up to heaven and say, God, you know that man down there? And the Lord said, yeah, he's wicked. 
See, you can look good to men and bad to God. The book says that which is high esteem among men is abomination to God. You hear me this morning? It doesn't matter how this world looks at you. It's how God looks at you. There's been a lot of times people got the wrong idea about me. They said, Danny Castle ain't this. No, Danny Castle said this. No, why don't Danny Castle, why did he do this and that and the other? You know why I don't let it worry me too much? Because what really matters is what God Almighty sees in me. I know this morning what he sees. He sees an old sinner side grace covered by the blood. And when he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. It, you may be a beautiful before men, but yet wicked in the sight of God. You know a lot of people remind me of a shiny apple. And when you bite it, it's rotten and got worms in it. You're pretty outside. You've got it all fixed up. But inside your heart, you're full of evil worms and rotten. And you'll stink because God looks inside. You remind me of a real pretty house with a lawn trim. And the bushes cut just right. And flowers outside the house. And crook eyes. And azalea bushes. And, and, and all kinds of boxwoods. And a paved driveway. And then you open the door. And there's just filth. And nasty diapers. And, and food all over the place. And roaches. And the smell will knock you down. That's the way some of you pe people are. You got it all looking good on the outside. But God knoweth your heart. Number two. A man may be poor in the eyes of his neighbors, but rich in God's sight. I used to like that song. I forgot who it was. I used to get up and sing it. But it was Treasures Unseen. And the song went like this. My home may not look like a castle. Good, bad choice of words there, but that's what the song said. My clothes may be lacking in style. And then he went on to say, But oh, it's not what you see That makes me a king, makes me a king. To me, I've everything, all that I need. See, a man can be poor in the eyes of his neighbor, but rich in the sight of God. Lesson number three. A man may have a beautiful funeral, but yet be a miserable soul. Can you imagine what kind of funeral that dude had? Oh, they stretched him out there and probably bought him a solid gold casket and opened up the lid of that thing and all the dignitaries, the mayor, the sheriff, the big shops in town, all the flusies and uh, all the, the big people around the community that were well known were attending that funeral and they looked down upon him and said, a fine citizen of our community has deceased and our community is not uh, well off as it was and you know, a great loss that we've suffered and all that. Boy, they had a beautiful funeral and this guy come up and there were flowers all over the place. You know, I, I've thought about that. How sickening, how hypocritical, how abominable that is. A guy spends half of his life in a bar and the other half in honky tonks, chasing women, drinking liquor, running around like living like a devil. But then when he dies, everybody gets real religious and brings him in and talks about the Bible and how a good person he was. And all. you know what? God Almighty's up there saying, "You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong." A man have a beautiful funeral, but yet be a a miserable soul. All the pomp, all the flowers, all the mourners that they probably had to pay to come in and cry and the casket and everything, brother, will just soon pass away. But at that moment, that was lifting up his eyes saying, oh, help me, help me, help me. How many, how many funerals do you think went on this week in the United States where people were being nice and shaking hands and dressing up and eating big meals and having, having almost a celebration and bring time that person that they were looking at's body was in hell screaming for a drop of water on their tongue. Number five. I'm sorry, number four. A man may be buried like a dog and yet have angels for his pallbearers. They said about Lazarus, 
They rattle his bones over the stones. He's only a pauper who nobody owns. You picture a bunch of like this. Picture a caterpillar going down through here dragging an old cocoon to its resting place. Now, a caterpillar ain't too pretty. My daughter thinks they are, but I, I just disagree with her. Caterpillar looks like one of you men's mustaches walking, running around. And that caterpillar drags that old cocoon around and drops it. And then all of a sudden you see something go. And great, big, pretty wink. They're yellow. Bright yellow and red and got spots on them and trimmed in black like an artist had painted them. And then takes to the skies. That's the way it is when a poor man has his funeral. Lazarus had stars. Oh, Lazarus was a caterpillar. Oh, Lazarus was that old caterpillar and laid in the ground. Boy, he sprouted man out of there and he sailed off down into Abraham's bosom. And boy, he was clothed in a robe of white and it looked good, brother. It looked good. That's what a, that's what a man's funeral can be like. Number five, a man may possess abundance of this world's goods but in the world to come be destitute of the common mercy, water. We've had people this week in the United States could have given away $100,000 and never missed it. And right now can't get a drop of water. Right now can't get a drop of water. man said to me one time, he said, it ain't hell right here on earth. And I said, no it ain't. He said, Are you sure? I know it ain't. He said, how you know? I said, well, you can go over and get you some water. There ain't no water in hell. You can get water. You ain't in hell. Oh, this man here can't get a drop of water there. Can you imagine those people that are so spoiled like movie stars and athletes and rock singers and all these people that say, I can have anything I want anytime I want and everybody's got to do what I want. You imagine them getting down there and begging for a drop of water and can't get no water and being reduced from a mansion in Beverly Hills to a beggar in hellfire. Brother, I tell you, that's something to think about. You look at this. Lesson number six. That if a man neglect his opportunities to be saved in this life, he will regret it in the next life. You're sitting here this morning hearing, hearing me preach. You've got an opportunity to be saved. You've got an opportunity to turn life over to Jesus Christ and allow Him to come into your heart, wash your sins away, and be your personal Savior. And if you neglect that opportunity, you'll regret it. Time proves this. If you neglect your hope, you lose it. If you neglect your wealth, you lose it. If you neglect your soul, you lose it. And you regret those opportunities that you let slip by and never done what you should have done. Number seven. Though saints and sinners meet together now, the time will come when they will be eternally separated. You see, we're all together now. We're just mixed into a big bunch. And the Christians are saying, these sinners are giving me a... And the sinners are saying... These Christians are giving me a fit. Don't worry. The time's going to come when they're going to be separated and some's going to be here and the others are going to be here. And there ain't no stage down through there where you come in between, you know, purgatory, third level, eighth level, sixth level. All of them's over here and the others are over here. Number eight. We learn this. That prayers in hell avail nothing for themselves or for others. You see, the rich man in hell said, Help me! Can't help you! You can't have your prayer answered in hell. So he says, Help my brothers! And he said, You've they've got the scripture, we can't answer that prayer either. Nobody gets a prayer answered in hell. And by the way, let me throw this in while I'm on this subject. 
you're wasting your time praying for anybody after they've done gone to hell. There's thousands and thousands of places this morning where thousands and thousands of prayers are being said or read for people that are in hell. I was up in Pennsylvania preaching uh, a couple of years ago, and the pastor took me into a humongous, big, giant Catholic church. And it had these little boxes around. It looked like little slot machines. And I said, what's that? He said, that's a money box. And he said, people put money in that box. And the more money they put in there, and the more prayers it's prayed, the quicker their loved ones will quit burning in purgatory. Now you can say what you want to, friend. That is a sickening abomination to God Almighty. That's an insult to the Scriptures. There's no proof in it. There is no such thing as that in this Bible. You waste your time praying for somebody after they're dead and gone. You waste your time praying to anybody beside the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty. You can beg Mary to your blue in the face and it ain't going to get somebody out of hell after they're gone. Mary can't get she's a sinner just like us. Prayers avail nothing for themselves or for others. By the way, if it did, there'd be a revival because there's more praying in hell than they are here. I guarantee you he learns how to pray when he gets to hellfire. There's more students here praying in hellfire this morning than there are in all the churches put together. But it's too late. Number nine, this is last. Get this lesson. Those who will not hear will someday perish without remedy. Now it's like this. Everybody in this church has to remind what you think about Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't know for a fact that you're saved, I'm declaring to you that Jesus Christ is your only hope of ever not going to hell. You don't have no other hope. And if you don't want to go to hell, you come to Jesus and accept Him as your Savior. Other than that, hell is your destination. According to the greatest, highest authority on planet earth, the Bible. So you see, you're forced into it. Teenagers, you've got to make a move. Mamas and daddies, you've got to make a move. Some young person in this building this morning, you know deep down inside that things ain't right. You know you're not saved. You know if you got killed today in a car wreck, or you know if something terrible happened, you know that you'd go to hell. And God loves you through the Son of God on the cross. For God so loved the world when Jesus died on the cross, God was saying to the world, I love you through my Son. And He wants to save you and come into your heart this morning. You're a sinner. You've broken the law. You've lied. You've stolen. You, you've, you say, I ain't never stole nothing, preacher. You stole God's breath and didn't use it for Him. Stole His glory. You've stolen you stole something. You've, you've told lies. You've, you've coveted. You've broke God's commandments. And there ain't no hope for you except mercy through the cross of Calvary. Now that's some lessons. If you'll learn those lessons and believe them, you'll look at life different and you'll know where you're going when you die. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. I want to ask you a question, friend. Do you know for a fact where you're going when you die? Every person in this room that say, Brother Danny, I know for a fact there's a lot I don't know. But there's one thing I do know. I know that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. I want you to raise your hand right quick. 
God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Many, many hands all over the building gone up this morning. I want to ask you something. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to help you this morning make that step that you need to make. You don't want to be like this man and go to hell. No matter how bad you visualized hell while I was preaching, it's 10,000 times worse. Christian people are praying for you this morning. Young lady, teenager, mom, dad, young man, why don't you let the Lord touch your life this morning? Why don't you get this thing settled? You don't know how much longer you've got to live. Why don't you come? Dear Lord, please do what ought to be done right now in this service. Help that young man, that young lady, that mom or that dad to make that step they need to make and come to Jesus before it's too late. In his name we pray. Amen. You know this morning, God wants to do something for somebody. If you're here this morning, you don't know for a fact you're saved. Why don't you come? Why don't you just get out of your seat right now? Say, I'm going to settle this thing once and for all. Come on. Come on right now. Come on. Without one plea. But as I would. You need to come. Just get out of your seat and come. Come on, young man. Young lady. Come on. It's not worth it going to hell. It's not worth it. These are praying over here on Ask You Something. God dealing with your heart. I am Is the Lord speaking to you today? Why don't you get it settled? Get it settled. Who is my soul of one dark blood? 